All right, good evening, everybody. My name's Richard Perring, and I'm the learning manager for the Royal Parks. Uh, if you haven't come across us before, the Royal Parks is the charity that uh, manages eight green spaces across London. So we have Greenwich Park over in the east, uh, Hyde Park, Kensington Gardens, St James's Park, Green Park, uh, St James's Park, I've said that already, St James's Park, uh, and Regent's Park in the centre of London, uh, and Bushy and uh, Richmond Parks over in the west. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, I know that many of you will have uh, come through to this from the Great Exhibition Road Festival uh, Explore at Home series, which we're uh, really uh, happy to be involved in. And I just wanted to say thanks to the team there for, for helping to set this up. Uh, I'd also like to introduce Barbara Askew, who uh, is generously volunteering her, her time this evening to, to lead the second part of this event. Um, Barbara is a, a blue badge guide with an immense uh, wealth of knowledge about the Albert Memorial, amongst other things. Um, so, uh, so you can consider me her, uh, her warm-up act. Um, she, uh, she very kindly does uh, guided tours of the Albert Memorial for us in normal times, so uh, we, we hope to get back to doing some of those um, uh, next year, and, uh, and I very much hope that this will inspire you to come and join one of those and, and see it in real life. Uh, in the talk this evening, uh, Barbara is, uh, is going to of course, share her knowledge of the um, amazing design of the Albert Memorial, uh, its meaning and, and a bit about Prince Albert's life. Uh, but before that, I'm going, to, I'm going to look at one of his greatest achievements, uh, of course, the Great Exhibition of 1851. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, we are recording this event uh, tonight to be uploaded to YouTube afterwards, uh, but you won't be identifiable uh, by attending. And, and as you will have seen, you, uh, you, you, uh, you aren't identifiable at the moment. You, you can't uh, contact other attendees, but you can, you can contact us. Uh, there's a Q&A box. You, you should see a little icon in the corner of your, your screen there. So if you have a question, um, please do use that function to, to send it through. Um, and then we'll try and answer as many as possible um, at, at the end after the talks. Um, so let's get started. So if you um, go and visit the site of, uh, of the Great Exhibition of 1851 in Hyde Park today, uh, you'll find a, a, a flat open space, uh, which, is, uh, which looks like this. It's now a, a, a group of football pitches. Um, there are a few subtle plaques in the ground marking out where the building stood, but you could well not realise that anything significant uh, has happened here. But there's a huge, a huge story to be told about the events of 1851 and the, the people involved in the, and the legacy of the Great Exhibition. Uh, it's particularly important to us at the Royal Parks because um, obviously it took place in Hyde Park, uh, but also uh, because Queen Victoria grew up in Kensington Palace, a short walk away. Uh, her husband, Prince Albert, was one of the masterminds of the exhibition. Um, here he is on the left. And one of the other masterminds, uh, Sir Henry Cole, is buried in Brompton Cemetery, uh, which is one of the other green spaces that we look after in London. Uh, in a, he's buried in a fairly unassuming grave um, in, in Brompton Cemetery there. Uh, I'm going to focus on the, on the building itself, the Crystal Palace building itself, how it came about uh, and the role of uh, Prince Albert and his colleagues in making it happen. And I'm, I'm hoping uh, that in, in the short time we've got, this will make you want to find out more about the exhibition's contents and, and its legacy for yourself. So here's a map of, uh, of Hyde Park today, of course, right in the centre of London, uh, but it hasn't always uh, had a huge city surrounding it. Uh, the land originally belonged to the church and uh, was taken by Henry VIII in 1536 to be used as one of his hunting grounds and, and of course over the centuries London gradually grew around it and today we're used to holding big events in Hyde Park uh, whether it's the British summertime concerts uh, or winter wonderland that happen on the parade ground on the eastern side of the park or whether it's our own half marathon which uh, starts and finishes at the site of the great exhibition I'll sort of zoom in on the map a little bit here so you can see um, see that area of the park where uh, where that takes place and, uh, and this is what the site looks like with uh, lots of happy runners passing through it. Uh, now, in my job, uh, I, I'm, I'm very lucky. I get to see uh, a snapshot of the incredible work and planning that goes into making those types of events happen. And I think to me that makes it even more incredible uh, to think that such a huge event was pulled off in such style nearly 170 years ago um, with the Great Exhibition. So how did it come about? Uh, and how, how was it engineered? So 
Uh, so Hen Henry Cole, uh, the, the gentleman on the right, um, was an assistant keeper at the record office at the time. Uh, he, he was one of those people that had an incredible life. He was um, uh, did lots of things over his lifetime, including um, launching the first commercial Christmas cards, um, and he was responsible for the introduction of the penny post, uh, which partly responsible. Uh, he met Prince Albert as, uh, as Prince Albert worked on a series of small events, um, uh, small exhibitions for the Society of Arts, of which he was president. Henry Cole put forward an idea uh, for a British exhibition to be held in 1851, uh, which he proposed should be held in the courtyard at Somerset House. Uh, he got the go ahead uh, and Prince Albert's support and he uh, went to do some research. Uh, so he went on, a, I suppose, a bit of a jolly over to Paris uh, to, to visit the Paris Exposition of, uh, of 1849 uh, to see basically how he could beat it, how he could go one better. Uh, and he came back uh, basically having found that A, it was big, very big, uh, and B, uh, include, it included exhibits um, not just from France, but from uh, from other countries too, from, particularly from France's northern uh, North African colonies. Um, so he decided his exhibition should be much bigger, uh, and that it, Somerset House was no longer big enough to contain it. Um, so he needed to look for another um, uh, another venue and. He also felt that it should be a truly international event. Uh, it shouldn't just be confined to British uh, exhibits. Uh, and, uh, and Prince Albert agreed. Uh, they chose Hyde Park as the venue with just 18 months to go before it was due to happen. Uh, at this point, I'm going to uh, switch over to a virtual reality recreation of the Crystal Palace. Um, so this is something that we, uh, we've been working on for a little while um, and, uh, and we launched about six months ago. Um, there we go. Um, we wanted to try and build, uh, bring the building back to life and to, to showcase what happened in this part of Hyde Park, because uh, as I said earlier, um, it, there's, there's not, a, not a huge amount to see uh, if you go and visit there now uh, in person. Uh, so we wanted to bring it to life and, and do justice to the story of what happened there. Um, the, the virtual reality recreation was built by a, a fantastic team at a company called Seymour and Learn, uh, and it was supported by the Royal Commission for the Exhibition of 1851, who we'll, we'll talk about uh, a bit more later. Um, so here, if, we're, uh, if you look at the virtual reality recreation, so it's, uh, uh, you can see we're looking at a modern day view across the Serpentine Lake, which is, uh, which is the lake in, in the middle of Hyde Park. Um, over here we've got a cafe, uh, the, the, the Serpentine Bar and Kitchen. Uh, that's another, of course, is another modern feature. But apart from that, um, if you'd been standing there in 1851, it wouldn't have looked hugely different. Um, the park, Hyde Park, has never been significantly built on. It would have looked much the same, uh, minus that cafe and, uh, of course, minus Knightsbridge Barracks, which now stick up uh, above the horizon there. Uh, but just in front of Knightsbridge Barracks, you can see your first uh, view of of the, the Crystal Palace uh, virtual reality building. Um, so how did uh, how, how did this building come to come to take take the form that it did? Well, um, Henry Cole and Prince Albert formed a, ro a royal commission to organize the great exhibition and they put out a call for designs. 245 plans were eventually submitted for the temporary building and they rejected all of them. Uh, they decided instead to the, the committee to put forward their own, which was basically a hybrid of, of, of lots of them, uh, and the building was to be made of brick and iron. Uh, it was uh, sort of a bit like a, a station, a train station, uh, but with a huge great big dome uh, stuck on top, uh, and it was roundly laughed at by the public and, and in the media. Uh, so uh, they were in a bit of a bit of a tricky situation, and with less than a year to go, um, Henry Cole met a man called Joseph Paxton, who had heard what had happened and, and thought that perhaps he could help. Paxton was a, an experienced gardener uh, and garden designer and had built bridges, reservoirs, uh, fountains, and he built uh, the great conservatory at Chatsworth, a, a huge glass house. And it was this that he used as a, a, a big uh, part of his inspiration for, um, for the, the, the Crystal Palace. Uh, he decided he decided to use glass and iron, which would be cheap, uh, simple to put up, uh, and could be taken down easily with minimal damage to the park. Uh, he drew up completed designs in nine days flat. 
we're uh, we're just going to move over now, um, uh, uh, sort of flying across the lake over to the south entrance of the of the building to take a bit of a closer look. So hopefully now you can start to see um, and get get a sense of the scale of the building, which is one of the uh, one of the aims of of having this recreation. The committee uh, accepted Paxton's design on the condition that uh, that they should adjust it to avoid removing any further trees from the park. So some trees had already already been cleared, um, and uh, and the Victorians, uh, even more so than we are, were were um, were um, took the took urban green space very seriously, and so um, people got very upset when when trees needed to be removed. Um, so they didn't want to do any more of that. So they had to change the design of the building to incorporate uh, incorporate the existing trees. So they built this huge transept which stretched to 108 feet high um, to, in order to keep those trees in place. And we'll, we'll see those trees in, in just a moment. Um, while we're standing at the sort of at the entrance here, the, Vic the Victorians were very good at record keeping. So uh, so we have a plethora of statistics about the Crystal Palace. And I'm just going to give you a few of those again to give you a sense of scale. Um, there were 3,300 iron columns 2,150 girders, 900,000 square feet of glass in in uh, in 293,655 panes, uh, 600,000 cubic feet of timber, uh, and the whole thing incredibly was built in just five months uh, by 2,000 a big, big team of 2,000 men. One unique thing that you can see from this position here was uh, was that the Paxson uh, design included pipes which would um, these 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 pipes here which would hold the iron columns together and also act as uh, as drainage for for water from the building so that was that was quite an innovation at the time um, these pipes stretched to 34 miles in total um, and uh, and they were mainly manufactured on site uh, using specially machine uh, special machinery that was brought, brought in to do that uh, those pipes uh, had another unique feature they also had grooves that they could um, uh, that could be used in some parts of the, the palace to um, to run trolleys along uh, so that they could carry the glass panes into place. So they built the structure, built the pipes and then uh, could use the grooves in the pipes to, to move the, the, the glass panes into place. After the glass pla uh, panes had been put in place, then came the painters um, and we'll see some of the paint work uh, again when we go inside in just a moment. And when the paint was dry, uh, another team came in immediately behind that and, and started building the display, display stands in that area. And they gradually filled those display stands with the 100,000 exhibits that, uh, that filled the Great Exhibition. And as this building started to emerge, uh, it was Punch magazine that christened it the, the Crystal Palace. Uh, just before we go in, we're going to just turn uh, this way uh, and uh, and just head over. We'll, we'll jump over to, to one end of the building. This is the uh, over to the eastern side. Um, so and if we swing around here, you can see the side view of the building um, just there. Um, so you can see, uh, you know, some people have been put in um, as a bit of an illustration of uh, what the visitors would have looked like and to give a bit of a sense of scale of the building. Um, when it came time to uh, to open, uh, London was absolutely heaving um, and uh, and and the, the, the building emerged. There was a, a, a People were increasingly excited. Um, the poet William Makepeace Thackeray uh, wrote a poem uh, to, to commemorate the occasion. Uh, and, uh, and it went, but yesterday a naked sod, the dandy sneered from Rotten Row and cantered over it to and fro. And see it is done as though twere by a wizard's rod, a blazing arch of lucid glass leaps like a fountain from the grass to meet the sun. So he was certainly impressed. Um, and when the time came to open uh, on the 1st of May 1851, uh, London was absolutely heaving. Uh, hotels and boarding houses were booked up. Uh, there were huge traffic jams uh, with all the carriages uh, trying to get around. Five cavalry regiments and seven battalions of infantry were stationed uh, in Hyde Park to deal with any trouble. And 6,000 extra police were on duty in London. Uh, we're going to go inside now, so we'll just um, swing back around to where we were. So if you recall, we were at the south entrance. Uh, and uh, we're just going to go through the front door. So there you can see one of those elm trees that, uh, that was standing in the park that the building was constructed around. And if we move a little further in, there's the other one. 
and that puts us in the very centre of the building. So from here, hopefully you can start to get a get a sense for uh, just how huge it was. Um, and uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about um, about what was in here. I'm going to give you an overview of the types of exhibits that were on show and pick out a few of them to talk about. But uh, there was obviously so much here, 100,000 exhibits on, on show, um, such a variety of objects on display and it would, it would take all night to go through them. And um, uh, I just want to give you a flavour. Uh, what you can do is um, after the talk's finished, go on to our website uh, and you can access this uh, virtual reality recreation for free. You can um, uh, sort of move around it yourself and, and you'll find uh, in various spots there are these little icons that you can click on to find uh, information and images of what was there at the time. So I'll, I'll leave you to do that at your leisure. But just to pick out uh, some of the key uh, key parts of it, I suppose. Um, first of May came, 500,000 people were in Hyde Park, uh, half a million people uh, around the park and 30,000 in the Crystal Palace building itself. Um, and if you compare that for scale with uh, with the concerts that we hold um, today, uh, in, uh, we have about 60,000 people that come to those open air concerts. So um, it was absolutely jammed in the park. Uh, they uh, they were making a big uh, big deal of the opening. Queen Victoria was coming to to open the exhibition, uh, and they put a model fig uh, model frigate uh, on the serpentine, ready to fire a salute on the Queen's arrival. Uh, which was uh, obviously a great idea with all this glass around um, and uh, there's a lovely quote from the Times newspaper uh, warning that, uh, that the concussion will shiver the glass roof of the palace and thousands of ladies will be cut into mincemeat. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the gun was actually fired and, and thankfully the, the ladies were OK. Um, just to, 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 to go a little bit into what was here, so we're looking here at, uh, at the centrepiece of the exhibition or one of the centrepieces. It was a, a huge fountain, 27 feet high. You can get a bit of a sense of scale again from the figures next to it, um, uh, made of four tons of pink glass. Uh, and as well as being a, a pretty spectacular centrepiece, it was a, it was a useful meeting point um, for, for, for family and friends to, to catch up with each other as they, as they moved around the exhibition. And the water helped to cool the air as well, because as you can imagine, uh, on a sunny day, it got pretty hot in there. Uh, there were 14,000 exhibitors presenting the 100,000 exhibits across uh, about 11 miles of stalls. Um, broadly speaking, if we look down to the um, uh, down to down to, to the eastern side, this was where the the foreign exhibits were, yeah, and the British exhibits were over on on the western side. Uh, and so the British exhibits did take up about half of the the space that was available. Uh, the exhibition was organised by country and then further by the, the type of industry or, or, or product. Um, and the full name of the, the exhibition was the Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations, which is quite a grand title, but actually possibly even something of an understatement considering what was on, on show. So um, you, you had jewellery. Uh, so, for example, the, the Koh-i-Noor diamond, uh, which was uh, the world's largest known diamond at the time, uh, the, the name meaning mountain of light. Um, and this was one of the most popular attractions, which was in the on the India stand. Um, although actually when people went to visit it, many of them did find it disappointing because it didn't quite sparkle in the way that they were expecting. Um, it has been recut since and is, uh, is now part of the crown jewels uh, at, the, at the Tower of London. Uh, but lots of jewellery on display, uh, musical instruments. Uh, there were huge organs at, at each end of the of the building, um, and these were used in the opening ceremony. Um, and other musical instruments on display too. There was industrial and agricultural equipment, uh, like a huge hydraulic press. Uh, there were vehicles, trains, fire engines, marine engines. Uh, there were building materials and architectural models, and quite a lot of textiles as well. Um, there were weapons, quite a lot of weapons. It was um, obviously meant to be a exhibition promoting peace and, uh, and, and, and collaboration between nations, but quite a lot of weaponry on display. Uh, there was food, there were medicines, um, there was art, a lot of art and, and furniture uh, and much more besides. And to pick out a few perhaps slightly odd exhibits, um, uh, there was a there was a set of false teeth that were designed to be yawn proof, uh, which I, I suppose you would think is a no brainer. You, you, um, you don't want your teeth to come out when you when you yawn. Uh, there was a, a carriage that was drawn by kites, uh, hasn't hasn't caught on. Uh, there was a bed that ejected you at the time that you uh, set it to wake you up. Uh, also, maybe something to, to that we can take forward in the future. 
um, America booked so much space, um, they booked too much space, in fact, and struggled to fill it. Um, so they sent quite a strange selection of items, including piles of biscuits, uh, mounds of soap and 6,000 fossils, um, all fronted by a, a model eagle with the stars and stripes draped over it. Uh, China, on the other hand, booked some space but sent nothing. So the organisers had to scour British shops and warehouses for examples of Chinese produce. Um, so that was a, a, a little bit strange too. Uh, but of course, um, aside from these uh, oddities, there was a phenomenal amount of, uh, of useful innovation on display too, uh, arising out of uh, the successes of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, so we've been in the centre for for a moment. We'll head over to the to the to the western end. Um, so come over to here so from this this end you can perhaps see the full length almost the full length of the building uh, and if we look down to the south uh, on this side of where we're standing here um, there were shawls and woolen fabric and um, behind these stands here there was uh, hardware so locks and that sort of thing on display um, and behind that was agricultural machinery and then if we swing round onto the north side um, over here was a display of minerals and then beyond that there were carriages and, and locomotives uh, and then in the distance at this point over here there was one of the refreshment courts and um, so this was I suppose a, a precursor to the modern shopping centre food court um, and also the great exhibition is famous for, for having the first um, paid for public toilets uh, which cost a penny to use so gave rise to the phrase spend a penny um, and uh, as, as you saw in the, the earlier photo that I showed at the beginning of, of the, the site as it is today, the Victorians did a pretty good job of clearing up the exhibition without trace um, uh, after it had finished. But about five years ago, we um, we did find the remains of one of those toilets whilst uh, while we were doing some, some maintenance work in the area. Um, and actually some of the underground drainage pipes that were installed for the building um, are, are still in use today. Um, I'll just pop up to the to the first floor where you can have a, a really nice view of the of the roof and the the um, the building techniques that we used here as well. So again, I mentioned those pipes that were in use here, so that gives you a nice sense um, sense of that. You can have a good uh, a good view of the the way that the panes of glass were arranged. Uh, and then if we go out of the other end of the building um, over uh, to the western side, here you can see um, the building from a little further away, and we can switch here between. Um, today's view uh, of the park uh, as it stands and then how it was in, in 1851 where the trees were obviously a bit smaller. The Great Exhibition closed after um, only six months but during that time six million visitors passed through its doors. Uh, Joseph Paxton put a proposal to the government to leave it in Hyde Park uh, but this was refused and uh, and it was it was taken down uh, and then uh, rebuilt even bigger in Sydenham in South London. Uh, where it stood for quite a long time before unfortunately burning down in 1936. Uh, the Great Exhibition made a made a profit of, uh, of 186,000 pounds, a pretty huge amount of money at the time, which was uh, which was used to establish South Kensington's cultural quarter, uh, including the Royal Albert Hall, uh, Natural History Museum and the, and the V&A Museums. Uh, many of these museums original exhibits came from the Great Exhibition. Uh, and the Royal Commission of 1851 continues to use the remaining funds uh, to support research in science and engineering and, and other projects as well. Uh, in our recreation here in this particular um, site, you can uh, you can swing around to see the modern day uh, Royal Albert Hall uh, and the Albert Memorial here. Uh, of course, these didn't yet exist when the Great Exhibition took place. It was a little while later that they were built. Um, so to pick up that side of the story, I'm going to pass over to Barbara. Uh, he's going to talk to you a bit about the the Albert Memorial. So while I uh, switch screens here and uh, take this off, Barbara, if you'd like to share your uh, share yourself your... as well. Um, and I'll just remind you that yeah. um, if you've got any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. So you should have a little question mark icon in your screen that you can do that on uh, and then we'll do our best to answer as many as we can um, at, at the end. OK, <coughs> so just um, put Barbara on the screen. There we go. So Barbara, you're uh, you're on the screen, so go for it. Ready to go. <clears throat> well, yeah. good evening, everybody. As you've heard, I'm Barbara Askew. I'm a London Blue Badge Guide and I'm a Royal Parks volunteer. And here we are looking at the Albert Memorial in its full glory. 
It was commissioned by Queen Victoria in memory of her beloved husband, Prince Albert, who died when he was just 42 years old in 1861. The memorial took 10 years to complete and it cost £150,000. That's over £18 million today and it was paid for by public subscription. Well, here's uh, Victoria and Albert by Winterhalter. We saw this image of Albert earlier. They were first cousins and they were born within a few months of each other. And a little known fact is that the same midwife or female obstetrician delivered both babies. Victoria was born at Kensington Palace on the 24th of May 1819 and Albert at Schloss Rosenau in Coburg in Germany on the 26th of August 1819. They married in 1840 and they had nine children together. Albert was patron or president of a long list of learned societies and he was doing most of the Queen's work for her. And in recognition of this, he was awarded the title of Prince Consort in 1857. By 1861, Albert was working a 17 hour day and his health was breaking down and he had the appearance of a much older man. He said to Queen Victoria, I do not cling to life. You do, but I set no store by it. If I knew those I loved were well cared for, I would be quite ready to die tomorrow. Well, here he is in an oil painting called The Last Moments of the Prince Consort, based on reports of the scene. After his death, Queen Victoria said of Albert, I depended on him for everything. I had absolutely no will of my own. He told me when to go to bed, when to get up. He ordered all my actions, all my thoughts. A competition was announced to design the Prince Consort National Memorial to give it its official title. There was a wide variety of approaches taken by architects, mostly in classical or Renaissance style. Charles Barry Jr, whose design we see here, envisaged an Italian Renaissance dome with a gallery allowing the public to view the sculpture from above. How different the memorial would have looked if this design had been chosen. Now Charles Gilbert Scott's was the only design in the Gothic style, which he argued was appropriate because it was the style of the exquisite Eleanor Crosses, erected by the grieving Edward I on the route carrying the coffin of Queen Eleanor from Lincoln, uh, where she died, to Westminster Abbey in, in the year 1290. And here is George Gilbert Scott, the architect of the Albert Memorial. He had the largest architectural practice in Britain. His office in London once received a telegram from him saying, I am in Coventry, why? He had so many projects on the go, he couldn't remember why he was there. Despite this, Scott viewed the Albert Memorial as the most important commission of his life and he threw himself into the project body and soul, writing weekly letters to the Queen on the progress of the work and missing only one week when his son died in 1865 at the age of 21. The building materials for the memorial came from all over Britain. The stone for the two and a half miles of grey granite steps, and here they are, that surround the memorial came from the Penryn quarries in Cornwall. Scott and John Kelk, the contractor who was to build the memorial, were never on good terms, but nevertheless, Kelk and his workmen did an admirable job. The granite columns, you can see them here and here, were cut on site and polished on site. And this was the first time this had ever been done in London. 
the workmen labored night and day during the freezing winter of 1866 to 67 and fires were lit around them to prevent the water they were using from freezing. Kelk completed the work for less than his £85,508 estimate, chiefly because he hoped to receive an honour. The engineer of the structure of the memorial was Francis Wentworth Shields, with whom Scott had worked on the stabilising of Salisbury Cathedral. In this wide view, we can see the marble statue groups of the four continents at the outer edges of the memorial. Europe on the left, Asia on the right, Africa behind and America also, but out of view. The memorial rests on 868 brick arches on a concrete foundation 17 feet thick and look, it all looks like catacombs. On seeing them, Sir Henry Cole, the first director of the South Kensington Museum, now the V&A of course, said to Sir Charles Grey, Queen Victoria's private secretary, you and I could be buried here. An executive committee was established in 1863 to oversee the construction of the memorial, which included Sir Charles Eastlake, president of the Royal Academy and director of the National Gallery. And then after he died in 1865, he was succeeded by the archaeologist Sir Henry Layard. Scott and the sculptors had to face the executive committee's constant advice and criticism. Now on this virtual tour, we're going to be looking at the memorial close up. Uh, you're going to see it so much better or you're going to see the statues so much better than you can actually see in real life. We're going to stop at the, start at the top at the cross. We'll come down to the angels, then we'll come down to the moral and Christian virtues, then we'll do the mosaics, then we'll do the statue of Albert and then we'll do the podium or Parnassus frieze um, at the bottom. So here I am standing in front of the gates of the memorial on a beautiful sunny day ready to start our tour. And so first we'll go to the corners and look at the continents which we saw in that earlier wider view. They represent the four corners of the earth from which the exhibits in the Great Exhibition came. Australia is not included though, because it did not exhibit at the Great Exhibition due to the long distance and the short planning time. Queen Victoria had the choice of the sculptors for the continents, the industrial arts, and also the statue of the Prince Consort, which she was going to pay for herself. But she found this very difficult. And she said, all the time, I felt a longing to tell my dearest Albert about it and to hear his words and remarks. I must also warn you before we start that almost all the sculptors who worked on the memorial profoundly wished they had never taken on the commission. So we've now gone to the southwest corner and here we have Europe by Patrick McDowell. Each of the continents consists of five figures and an animal, uh, and the animal represents the spirit of the continent. The figure sitting on the bull uh, is the, the spirit of Europe. There she is. And if we look at her this side, uh, you can just see that she's holding an orb and scepter. Uh, the reason being, and I quote, to symbolize the influence which Europe has exercised over the other continents. Now the bull was chosen from the myth of Europa, who in the form of a bull was seduced by Zeus. The figure on the left here holding um, a paint palette, a lyre and has a broken off uh, Roman column, that's Italy. And then to her right, the figure with the sword, um, that's France representing military power. And then coming to the other side um, with her feet on the waves, there's Britannia. 
Uh, she's holding a trident, but the top of the trident, I'm afraid, has been broken off. And then um, over to the right, the fourth figure is holding a book, and that's Germany, not seen as a military power in the 1860s, but as a peaceful country, the home of learning. The sculptors who worked on the memorial complained bitterly that they were losing money on their commissions. MacDowell was loaned £1,000, but he died in debt at the end of 1871. We're now moving over to the southeast corner. We have Asia by John Foley. The spirit of Asia is seated on an elephant, elephant and she is unveiling herself, symbolizing the revelation of Asian art and manufactures, particularly those of India, in the Great Exhibition. During the restoration work on the memorial done in the 1990s, Asia was given a new left breast and there were complaints that it didn't look right. The restorer said he couldn't get anyone to model for him. The four statues surrounding Asia are an Oriental potter, an Indian warrior, a Persian poet, and the one we can't see behind an Arab trader. We're now off to Africa. So Northwest Corner, Africa by William Theed, who was Victoria and Albert's favorite British sculptor. Now Theed wanted his animal to be the lion, but he was told by the executive committee it would be confused with the British lion and he had to settle for a camel instead. An Egyptian woman uh, is seated on the camel. There's a Nubian youth and there's a sort of Arab merchant. And then with his back to us, uh, we do have an African. And what we can't see is that he has chains around his ankles, but they uh, have been uh, loosed, symbolizing the end of slavery. Prince Albert was the president of the Society for the Extinction of Slavery, and he fought for the abolition of slavery beyond the British Empire. And next and of the four continents, and finally we have America by John Bell. The spirit of America, there she is, rides on a bison, and she's wearing Native American headdress. The woman on the right pointing to the future is the United States. The woman on the left holding a sheaf of corn uh, is Canada, and she's also holding the Rose of England to her bosom. Behind, you can't really see him, is a sort of cowboy or gaucho representing South America, and there's also behind an Aztec representing Mexico. So there you are, you have now seen the four continents. And so we're now going to go to the top of the memorial and we would have entered the gates. Um, we'll be entering the gates as well. Um, so here on top of the memorial is a cross. Now that cross was struck off in 1940. And when it was put back, it was given an east-west orientation. But in the 1990s restoration, it was put back to what it was originally, so it's north-south. And then beneath the cross, we have Angels by John Burney Philip. And there on the right-hand screen, you can see the angels um, in, in more detail. The upper tier are taking Albert's soul up to heaven. The lower tier are pushing away all earthly vices. Below the angels is the area that Scott called the tabernacle and he said it was the heart and soul of the monument and it contains the moral and Christian virtues by James Redfern uh, who was Scottish. So we're now going to go close up to these figures in the tabernacle the moral and Christian virtues. 
And this is where you really do gain by um, seeing a virtual tour. We would never be able to see these figures in this wonderful detail were we to be standing below, although obviously there would be other compensations. And so we're going to, uh, oh, by the way, uh, just to say a bit more about Redfern, he was the youngest of the sculptors. He was in his 20s when he worked on the memorial. And I'm afraid that he died in poverty at the age of 38. So starting on the left hand side, uh, this figure is fortitude. The one in the center, she's charity. She's bearing her breast and she's holding a flaming heart. And then on the right, we have prudence. She's studying a book and she's holding a serpent the traditional symbol of wisdom. So that's facing south. Now we're going to east and we can see prudence uh, once again on the left hand side. And in the center, this is humility. This was the most dramatic of the figures and she's gazing down and this thing she's got in her hand here, that's a very long candle. So that's humility. And then on the right, we have got temperance and she is holding a bridle. She is reigning in vice. Now we're going to look to the north and there's temperance again with her bridle. In the center here, <coughs> um, we have got faith and I, you can't quite see the top of her cross, but um, it is at the top there, but you can see her chalice. And then on the right, uh, you probably could have guessed this yourself. This is justice with sword and scales. And now we're going to face west and there's justice again. You can see her sword and her scales somewhat better now. And in the center, this is hope and she has um, an anchor and she's sort of gazing upwards. And then on the right, back to fortitude. And this time we can see that she is holding uh, Hercules lion skin and a club. We're now going to descend to the mosaics. And again, we are now facing south and this woman is Poesas, um, music and poetry she represents. Now the mosaics on the pediments were produced by Dr. Salviati in Venice, whose work uh, Prince Albert's, uh, so, sorry, he had done work on Prince Albert's Memorial Chapel at Windsor Castle and Scott thought this was very successful work. So Scott wanted him to do these mosaics. The 1100 square feet of exposed mosaic on the Albert Memorial is the largest on any exterior in Europe, except for that on the Cathedral of Orvieto in Italy. So as I've said, this is Poesas representing poetry and music. Now, each of these figures sits on a throne and there's two little figures in the niches of the throne. And so what we have here is David there and on the right we have Homer. And then below on the podium, there are poets and musicians. So whoever the female figure in the mosaic above, exponents of that art are in the podium frieze below. So we've now gone to the east side and we're looking at pictura, painting. And um, she has got, oh, she's holding a paint palette and uh, in the niches of her throne. This is Apelles, who was a, a Greek artist or painter. And then on the right hand side, um, we have got, of course, Raphael, Albert's favorite artist. Now I'm going to show you a close up of the green dress of Pictura. And you can really see it's a mosaic. Um, just to make the point that before the restoration work began in the 1990s, uh, the memorial was so dirty 
that the restorers didn't even know that this woman's dress was green. Right now, let's go to the north side and we can see architectura or architecture. And what is she holding? She's holding the design for the Albert Memorial. And the figures in the niches of her throne are Solomon on the left and Ictinus, the architect of the Parthenon, on the right. And then finally, we go to the west side and we have Sculptura or sculpture. And she is holding a maquette in one hand and she's holding a, a sculptor's maul or mallet in her other hand. And in the niches of her throne, can't remember who they are. <laughs> I think it's Michelangelo. No, sorry about that. I've, I've momentarily had a blank on that. So let's move down to the canopy. And um, in his design, Scott wanted the memorial to resemble something called um, a kiborium. And that is an altar or a shrine containing the relic of a saint, something encrusted with jewels. The idea being that the preciousness of the decoration expresses the value attached to the object it contains. In other words, the statue of the dear departed prince. And we can see all these jewel like stones and decoration and we can also see part of the dedicatory inscription which runs round the four sides of the memorial. So as you can see here, it says Queen Victoria and her people, and then it goes on to the memory of Albert Prince Consort as a tribute of their gratitude for a life devoted to the public good. And then under the canopy, we can see stars and we can see Queen Victoria and Prince Albert's coats of arms and Albert's motto, which was Troy und Fest, true and steadfast. And this work was carried out by J.R. Clayton of Clayton and Bell. Now we're going to descend to the statue of Prince Albert himself for which the Queen chose her favourite sculptor, Carlo Marochetti. Scott had always thought of the statue to be that of the Prince sitting in sort of regal dignity. And Scott went to Marochetti's studio to see the plaster model for the statue. And he wrote in his diary that it gave him a severe shock. He didn't like it at all and he thought it would ruin the whole memorial. He then had a stroke of luck, Marochetti died and John Foley, the sculptor of Asia, was chosen to take over. The statue of Albert was cast in 1500 pieces from 12.2 tonnes of gunmetal given by the government from the Woolwich Arsenal. Foley himself died unexpectedly in 1874, but he had left instructions from which his assistant Thomas Brock was able to continue. Albert's statue is three times life size or 14 feet in height. He's dressed in garter robes and his cloak is draped artfully over his knee and that solves the delicate problem of a seated male figure viewed from below. Queen Victoria paid for the statue and so Foley only charged £5,000 instead of the planned £10,000. What would Albert have thought of this bronze statue of himself coated in gold leaf? Well, I'm afraid he would not have liked it. This is what he said when after the great exhibition, it was proposed that a statue of him commemorating his role in the exhibition should be placed in Hyde Park. I had much rather not be made the object of such a monument. 
as it would disturb my quiet rides in Hyde Park to see my own face staring at me. And if it were to be an artistic monstrosity, like most of our memorials, it would disturb my equanimity to see myself permanently laughed at and ridiculed in effigy. So there we are. Now you can see that Albert is holding something in his hand and it is one of the volumes of the great exhibition catalogue and very touchingly he's got his finger in the page as if he's anxious not to lose his place. Now on the sides, um, on those columns that I showed you, uh, we have got female figures representing the greater sciences and they stand in two tiers um, on the memorial and they represent Albert's great interest in intellectual pursuits and education and they show us science as it was perceived at the time. Scott had originally intended to gild them but he eventually decided the memorial's colour balance was better if they remained in the natural finish of the bronze. The figures were shared out between Henry Hugh Armstead and John Burney Philip two young sculptors chosen by Scott. The figures on the upper level are 2.3 metres or 7 feet 6 inches high. So we start here on the left with physiology and if you've got exceptionally good eyesight you'll be able to see that she's holding a newborn baby. You can just see its little foot there as the highest manifestation of physical form. And she's got also a microscope and that's the means by which the Victorians made so many discoveries about the makeup of the physical world. The next one, this is rhetoric and she carries a speech uh, and she's sort of waving her finger as she's delivering it. And then we have medicine here holding a cup and a serpent, the symbols of Hygieia, the Greek goddess of health. And then finally, we have philosophy holding an open book in her hands. And I hear you say, well, they, they're not all sciences. Well, they were perceived to be sciences in the Victorian era. Now we're going to go to the lower level and these statues are taller. They are 2.5 meters or eight feet, four inches. We start with geometry here, who has a pair of compasses and is looking at a tablet inscribed with figures. We get uh, next astronomy. She has a circlet of stars and she's holding a sphere uh, and she's dressed as Urania, the classical muse of astronomy. We get the most praised figure next, and that is chemistry holding uh, a retort. And then finally, we have geology and she's carrying a sort of long hammer and she's got uh, a globe uh, in her hand, partly excavated because minerals have been taken out of the earth. We're now going to go to the um, industrial arts. So here we have uh, marble groups and these were the memorial's main acknowledgement of the contemporary world of the 1860s. The world you might say of Charles Dickens Coke Town in his novel Hard Times. In the centre of the group stands a female figure and she symbolises the spirit or genius of the particular industrial art and she instructs the other three figures. So the sculptor of this group um, was William Calder Marshall and here the genius of agriculture encourages the farm labourer to give up the horse-drawn plough in favour of the steam plough. The woman on the right with a lap full of corn um, is a harvester and there is a shepherd boy who we can't see. So uh, we now move on to um, Manufactures by Henry Weeks. Albert was greatly interested in new inventions. 
Here, the genius of manufacturers points to a beehive symbolizing industry and holds an hourglass showing the importance of time in industrial processes. A woman is holding the cloth she has made representing the textile industry. Here's a smith for the iron and steel industry and a boy potter holds a vase. There were no qualms at depicting child labor on the memorial. Now we go to the north side of the memorial and we get to commerce and the sculptor here was Thomas Thornycroft and he was chosen by the Queen as she explained because he is very poor and the Prince had a high opinion of his ability. The genius of commerce carries a cornucopia to symbolize the plenty that results from trade. There's a young merchant with balance scales and ledger and he was modeled on Thomas Thornycroft's own son, <coughs> Hamo, who himself became a sculptor. And then a youth kneeling opens a bag of corn um, and uh, there's a sort of oriental trader here with a jewel casket. The executive committee was far from happy with these um, industrial sculptural groups and they said of commerce, where is the ship, the chief agent of commerce of all ages? Well, finally, we come to engineering by John Lawler and this proved to be the most criticized of all the groups. The secretary of the executive committee, Doyne Bell, pronounced, Mr. Lawler's group, I cannot but consider a signal failure. Lawler made five models before producing a design that satisfied and his finished group was criticized by the committee as being roughly hewn and in parts damaged. So the spirit of engineering rests her hand on a steam engine. Two youths sit in front. The one we can see has a scroll and compasses. And over here sits a navvy in contemporary dress. Lawler asked the committee how they wished the navvy's trousers to look. As whatever I do, you'll criticize it. And yet Laura's group is the only one to show the contemporary working class and world. He included images of the Menai Bridge by Thomas Telford and the Britannia Railway Bridge by Robert Stevenson. Well, now it's time for us to go down to the Parnassus Frieze. And it consists of 169 figures around the podium upon which Albert's statue sits. And it's one of the great achievements of British sculpture. And it's one of the definitive works of Victorian high art. It's 1.83 meters or six feet high, and it's 64 meters or 210 feet long. Scott called it one of the most laborious works of sculpture ever undertaken. The work was divided once again between Henry Hugh Armstead and John Burney Philip, who took enormous trouble over the likenesses and dress of the figures. And in the case of more recent artists, talking to people who had known them. Armstead got the favorable east and south sides and he put his figures in national groups. Philip got the north and west sides and he arranged his figures chronologically. So we're starting with Philip's sculptors and they are the group that we today, were we to choose the figures, would change the least. Michelangelo sits in the centre with the tomb of Lorenzo de' Medici behind him and this is Donatello on, uh, on this side and on his other side, that is Pietro Torrigiano. And then down below, here is Phidias holding the figure of Athena that he sculpted for the Parthenon uh, in Athens. Philip received a lot of criticism. Sir Henry Layard asked Philip 
if he was aware that by tradition Phidias was bald. Now we go to Hugh Armstead's Poets and Musicians. And in the centre, we have Homer with his uh, lyre. And um, Sir Charles Eastlake made the very regrettable decision that the sculptures should be done in situ on the memorial, just like the frieze on the Parthenon. So the figures were literally hewn out of two feet thick slabs of Campanella marble, the hardest available, chosen to stand up to the pollution of 19th century London and susceptible to fracture and stunning. Next, the decision was made that the maximum depth of 12 inches be increased to 15 inches, and it's even 16 inches here by Shakespeare's knee. Armstead's likenesses were praised. A German visitor looking at the figure of Goethe to the right of Shakespeare said, it is Goethe. And then further right uh, to the right here, um, we have got Handel there. And here's the most praised figure of all, Beethoven. There he is. Right, we now go to the east side um, and look at Armstead's painters or artists. And seated in the middle, as you might expect, Raphael, Albert's favourite artist. And here's Leonardo da Vinci on one side and Michelangelo um, on the other side. And uh, Michelangelo appears on the monument twice. We saw him among the sculptors. There's two dogs on the frieze. There's Veronese's greyhound. And then down below here, this is William Hogarth's pug. And then next to the pug standing, that's Rembrandt sitting, that's Rubens. And to the right, that's Dürer and uh, Armstead modelled Dürer's dramatic hair from his self-portrait. Armstead's work was thought to be the superior of the two. Those who disliked the memorial still tended to like Armstead's work, uh, still tended to like his work, and thought him to be the only sculptor to have gained in reputation. Armstead and Philip were working under the direction of Kelk, the builder who supplied the marble. They were working against the face of the podium in Skylit Studios and in the freezing cold of winter. Armstead's arms and hands would start to shake and tremble whenever the foreman announced, Mr. Kelk is here. By 1870, Scott found both sculptors in a chronic state of anxiety. They had been working for six years without any remuneration, and he insisted that an extra £1,000 be granted to each of them. And here we see poor Philip being lectured by Sir Henry Layard, who is expressing his disappointment. Um, there's Layard, there's Philip. His disappointment with Philip's heads and is urging him to study ancient sculpture. These are Philip's architects ranged chronologically from the most recent on the left to the earliest on the right. <laughs> there arose the question of whether Scott himself should be included with the architects. It had been the policy from the start that the Parnassus frieze should not include any living artists and Scott had no intention of making an exception for himself but Queen Victoria insisted he should be included. So Scott gave way, but stipulated that he should only appear in profile. And there he is. Behind Augustus Pugin, who he regarded as his master. And finally, we get to the earliest of the architects, King Cheops the builder of the greatest of the pyramids of Giza. And he is standing behind 
the only female among the 169 figures on the podium frieze, Nitocris, an Egyptian queen of the sixth dynasty. She ruled in her own right and though a woman, but though a woman, but she frequently appeared in male dress. She's holding a model of the third pyramid, which she's not now thought to be responsible for. So, at last in the spring of 1872, the podium freeze was finished and the lean-to sheds removed. On the 1st of July that year, the Queen inspected the memorial and declared it to be really magnificent and Scott was knighted by the Queen. The statue of Albert was not unveiled until March the 9th, 1876, with no official ceremony to mark the occasion. Public reaction to the memorial was mixed. Some disliked the gilding, others thought the steps too massive. Judgments on the memorial <coughs> included a test for taste. Over complex sculptures by underpaid artists. An American tourist said, it has all the earmarks of an eyesore. Hermione Gingold wanted to make it her luxury on desert island discs. And finally, beyond question, the finest monumental sculpture in Europe. The end. Well, <laughs> well, thank you so much, Barbara. What a fantastic, uh, fantastic talk about the Albert Memorial. I, I think it's um, it occurred to me, it's just when you go to visit it, I think it's one thing to look at the memorial and you can see the the, the level of detail that's, that's been built into it, but it's quite another to, to understand the depth of meaning behind it and, and to have your wealth of knowledge, ex ex you know, uh, have you explaining explaining that I think is a, is a real privilege. So so thank you so much for for, for, for doing that and for um, and for all the time you put into preparing as well. Um, we, we have a few questions that have come in, so thank, thank you to, uh, to those of you that have submitted those. Uh, I'm afraid we won't have time to get through them all, but um, I'll, uh, there are a few about the Great Exhibition and the, the Crystal Palace that I'll attempt to answer, uh, and then there are a few uh, that, uh, about the Albert Memorial that I'll, uh, I'll put to Barbara, if, uh, if that's all right with you, Barbara. Um, so uh, the first question that we've got here is, uh, uh, how much did the, the Crystal Palace cost and, and who paid for it? Um, well, that's two questions sort of combined, but um, uh, well, it, it cost uh, about £150,000, just over, um, which e even in those times was actually quite a tight budget for, for what they were trying to achieve. Um, and uh, and it was paid for by public sub subscription. Um, with the organising committee um, held banquets to uh, to raise funds and they got manufacturers and businesses to underwrite it. And, and they actually even circulated collection boxes in, in working class areas. Um, which these days we might think might be a little bit um, uh, controversial, but um, their view was that um, uh, this was an opportunity or, or something that the, the working classes could benefit from um, just as much as any other class um, because it would be um, improving their lot effectively. So it would be you know, advertising British industry and, uh, and that they would see the benefits themselves. So that's why they were asked um, or offered the opportunity to contribute. Uh, another question was about uh, just about the length of the building. So it was um, 1,848 feet long um, by 408 foot, uh, feet wide. Uh, it's uh, there are there there are rumours on the internet, uh, or, or uh, it's, it's, I think it's even listed on the Wikipedia page that um, or one of the Wikipedia pages that it's um, that it was 1,851 feet long, which would have been um, very neat because of because of the year that it took place in, uh, but unfortunately that's not true. It was three feet shy of that, so um, but, but but still, you know, suitably impressive. Um, another question was about uh, about the, the virtual reality uh, uh, recreation itself. So the, the, the question was, how do we know uh, which displays were where? Um, so of course the building as we've recreated it is, is empty at the moment, so um, it is just showing the building itself rather than the great exhibition that was inside it. Um, as I, I mentioned a little earlier on, we've got information icons. So when you navigate around um, uh, the, the the recreation, you can click on those icons and that gives you some information about what was in that location and some pictures um, uh, where, where they where they're available. 
Um, so, uh, so and again, I'll, I'll put the link to it um, into the chat box at the end so that you can you can access that if you'd like to. Uh, but of course, there are all sorts of other sources of uh, information around uh, on, uh, on the internet. And uh, I, I was pleased to see as well that we had a uh, I had a comment from uh, the vice chairman of the Crystal Palace Foundation who's with us tonight. So um, that's great that uh, he was able to join and he, he um, mentioned that their website is a, a great source of information as well. So please do check that out if you'd like to find out more. Um, I think I will uh, put a couple of questions to Barbara as well, if that's OK. Oh, the other, the other thing I should mention is that um, we, we do want to progress that virtual reality project further. So our, our ambition is to fill it with um, fill it with the exhibits eventually. Uh, but of course, um, it, it takes uh, time and money to do that. So uh, that, that's what we'd like to achieve eventually. Um, so moving on to the uh, questions about the Albert Memorial. So um, let me just pop Barbara on the screen if that's OK, uh, Barbara. Uh, that's architects. Sculptors. There you go. So, um, so first question is, uh, and I, I think you may have covered this, but um, how long did the memorial take to build? Um, it took ten years, um, but Albert's when when Queen Victoria came along to see it, you know, at at its inauguration, Albert was still all covered up, um, so <clears throat> he wasn't he wasn't uh, visible. And I think I mentioned that Scott was knighted in 1871 um, when at the inauguration and uh, Kelk, the builder, was upset because Queen Victoria didn't speak to him. <laughs> Thank you. Um, another question uh, was about, uh, so uh, it says, I recently saw an, an image of the memorial with a glass structure covering it, which clearly was never installed. Why not? Um, so I, I, I wonder whether this person um, is talking about when it was under scaffolding, which certainly looked like it looked like a great rocket launch uh, pad or something. And that was in the 1990s. And um, they stopped work part of the way through because they ran out of money until they raised more. So it was under that scaffolding for a long time. That's what I think this person is thinking of. It was never under glass um, ever. Yeah, it would be probably be helpful to know when that picture was, uh, when that image was from. But I, I think you might be right, Barbara. Uh, but, but if uh, if, uh, if you, the person who submitted that, if you want more information, then please do send us the image. Um, I'd be really interested to see that. Um, another, I love this question. The memorial must make a perfect roosting place for birds. Um, yes. How is this? How is this deterred, and how much damage has been caused over the years? <laughs> well, I, I've been doing the tours um, since the memorial was restored, and um, I've seen what the birds do in the intervening period. I've also seen bits snapped off. You know, parts of fingers disappear. And the statue um, that Phidias is holding of Athena, that statue was holding a little statue of Nike, but that's gone. Um, so I'm afraid that the birds really love to um, nest. Uh, they love to perch on it. Their mark. Yes. And I think it's um, because the, the memorial looked quite different before it was restored, didn't it? And, and I think actually the impact of pollution from that surrounding the, the, the road nearby might, I, I don't know for sure, but might be um, might be more serious than the, the, the effect of birds. I know the memorial is cleaned regularly as, as best it can be. Uh, but I think Albert was uh, an entirely different colour, wasn't he? Uh, well, Albert, the, the gold was stripped off Albert in the First World War to prevent him attracting enemy aircraft. And it was said at the time, he looks much less ugly dull. <laughs> and so the gold was put back on in the 1990s and the angels and everything. So all the gold was stripped off in World War I. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think this might need to be the last one, but it, it, is there a, a tunnel between the memorial and the Royal Albert Hall? I think this might be a rumour as well. Well, I would, <laughs> if there is, I would love to go in it. <laughs> but uh, not that I know of. Can I just mention that I had a momentary blank when I was thinking about who was in the niches of the throne of Sculptura. It was Ictinus and Solomon, but somehow it just fled out of my brain at the time. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. And I also meant to tell everybody, you know, a lot of the things are labelled 
I mean, who would ever know who the 169 figures were without a lot, there's a lot of labeling uh, and naming on that, uh, on that memorial. Brilliant. Well, thank you again so much, Barbara, for, uh, for, 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 for doing this this evening. And um, I'm sorry we didn't get to answer to answer all of the questions there. Um, just to sort of to finish off, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the re recording of this will be um, will be made available on the, on the Royal Parks YouTube channel as, um, as soon as uh, we're able to get it up there um, in the next couple of days. Um, so if you know of anybody that'd be interested to find out about this, then um, please do pass that on to them. Um, and just a couple of other things to mention. Of, of course, you know, parks uh, have been so important to us over the over the past few months uh, to everybody uh, as uh, as the pandemic's raged on. Um, and uh, and uh, of course, we we at the Royal Parks we're a charity looking after these spaces. So uh, we really appreciate your support by just coming here and taking part uh, in this event and finding out more about them. Uh, but there are lots of other ways to support too. Uh, we'd uh, we'd we'll gladly accept donations. It has, costs a lot of money to um to keep the parks looking the way that they do. So um, if you're if you're able to do that, that would be uh, very much appreciated. Or just by coming to uh, another event in the future and um, uh, and 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 uh, finding out more about the parks, uh, we really appreciate that too. Uh, we have other upcoming events. Uh, so in, in uh, on the third of December, there's a discussion about um, a book called Wintering, uh, which is um, uh, we, we, we're doing that uh, linked to Brompton Cemetery. Um, so uh, thinking about. Um, uh, uh, going into hibernation and and, uh, and and the meaning of that for for for, uh, for people as well um, over over the winter months. Uh, so that's on the third of December. We've got uh, a, a talk called Christmas with Victoria and Albert. So if you're keen on the Victoria and Albert theme, there's uh, more about the traditions that they inspired and uh, and also about Kensington Gardens at this time of year. That's taking place on the 16th of December. Uh, and then on a more natural um, theme, we have a winter tree ID. Uh, talk uh, on the 28th of January. So if you want to know what trees you're looking at while the leaves aren't on them, um, that's one for you. Uh, and you can sign up to all of these through the upcoming events page uh, on our on our website. Uh, so uh, I think all that remains to say is uh, thank you very much for, for joining. I'm going to pop the link in the chat box now to um, if you want to have a look around the, 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 the Crystal Palace recreation yourself. And uh, I very much hope we'll see you again soon at another one of these talks. Thanks for joining. <laughs>